Trappist 1E. Did you ever wake up late, sprint to the window, and for a split second you don't know what day it is? Now imagine that confusion never ends. Because today, you're waking up on Trappist 1E. You open your eyes, the ground beneath you is warm and dusty, like someone baked a lava cake and forgot the icing. The sky? Remember that time you burnt toast? Yeah, like that. And the star? Just sitting on the horizon? Not rising, not setting, like it hit the world's longest snooze button. That's because Trappist 1E is tidally locked. One side always faces the star, while the other stays in eternal night. No sunsets, no sunrises. Just the same lighting forever. Great for Instagram aesthetics, but terrible for mental health. You stretch, step outside your shelter, and gravity welcomes you like an old friend. It's lighter than Earth's, but not weak enough to set you floating. It's that sweet spot, like walking after leg day, but it's pleasant. The terrain's rocky and red. Mars meets Arizona, if someone dimmed the lights and added a touch of alien loneliness. The air smells metallic thanks to basalt dust and ozone, assuming the atmosphere hasn't already taken a vacation. You're about three steps in when your brain goes, hey, remember the thing called survival? Your suit agrees, vibrating like a nervous cat in a thunderstorm. You take in a breath, briefly considering a good decision, then ignore that entirely and head toward the day side. And uh-oh, your suit's temperature skyrockets, triggering alerts like a fire alarm losing its mind over someone lighting a birthday candle. The heat here isn't just toasty, it's like the sun aggressively slapping you on the back. You barely have time to scream internally before the sky betrays you. The light shifts, something is wrong, and then boom, a solar flare hits. The sky flashes electric blue like the universe just smacked the reset button. Time to run. Shelter. Now. So, you turn toward the night side, and that's when the wind slams into you. Sharp, freezing gusts strong enough to strip away your soul. It's so cold your tears would freeze before you even realized you had eyes. You settle in the twilight zone, the narrow part of the planet where life might actually work. It's not too hot, not too cold, the Goldilocks zone for people who like breathing. You hunker down in a crater. It's your personal zero-star Airbnb. It's dead silent. The shadows? Frozen. The sun still hasn't moved. You take a sip of recycled water, trying not to think too hard about its origins. Then you look up at the dark sky. It's midnight, and as your base fades into the star's shadow, the endless night takes over. Only two nearby planets glow softly, hanging quietly in the darkness. You can't help but think, this place is 39 light years from Earth, but right now, it feels like I never left my overthinking brain. And just as your anxiety settles in for a nap, you remember, this is one of the most Earth-like planets we've discovered so far. Kepler-442b Now you might expect a dramatic launch sequence, countdown, hyperspace tunnel, the whole cinematic space travel package. But no, we're going to skip all of that. You take one breath, you close your eyes, and when you open them again, you're no longer on TRAPPIST-1E anymore. No alarm clocks here, just a slow-burning orange sun, stretching its rays across a sky the color of peach tea. If Earth mornings had a calm setting, this would be it. It's hard not to wonder, is this really 1,200 light years from Earth? You pull on your suit, a little tighter than usual. Gravity here is about 1.25 times the Earth's. So, you feel the difference. Every step's like walking with a loaded backpack, but hey, consider it your cardio for the day. Who needs a gym when the planet's always trying to crush your glutes, huh? Outside, it's quiet. Like, really quiet. The air feels cool, but not cold, like early spring. And the wind, gentle enough to mess your hair just a little, which would matter if anyone else were around. The landscape is straight up stunning. Forests, if they exist, sprawl endlessly. Their greenery darker than Earth's. Maybe it's the different sunlight, which is less intense and softer, like someone turned the contrast way down, but made the colors richer. The sky? Less blue, more sunset salmon. It glows all day like golden hour never ended. You walk up a small hill and spot a clear, calm pool of water nearby. You dip your hand in. The water's cool, fresh, no weird alien slime. A solid 9 out of 10 for swim rating. Looking up, the star looks a bit smaller than our sun, but way more relaxed. Kepler-442 doesn't throw solar flares like some overly dramatic star. 
No surprise radiation, no sudden bursts of heat, stuff like that. Just quiet, predictable space vibes. Kind of like the roommate who never hogs the thermostat. You keep walking, the day is long, like tens of Earth hours long, so there's no rush. You could set up a lab, cook a meal, do your taxes, and still make it to sunset. Speaking of which, when it finally comes, it's wild. The sun melts behind the horizon, and suddenly the whole sky lights up like someone poured red wine across the clouds. You stand there, speechless, like a tourist watching fireworks for the first time. As darkness creeps in, you head back to camp. A few small stars glow, but nothing too intense. Just a quiet reminder that you're floating on a stable, almost perfect planet in the middle of the cosmos. You curl up inside your brown sleeping pod, drink some hot tea, and think, if Earth ever ghosts us, I know where I'm moving. So you close your eyes, and when you open them again, LHS 1140B. You've landed on a tall, volcanic island, surrounded by endless ocean on LHS 1140B, a super-Earth just 49 light-years away. Around here, dry land is somewhat rare, and this high ground is the only thing keeping your boots dry. Gravity? It's about twice Earth's, so your bones are doing a motivational speech with every step. This super-Earth is mostly water. Mineral-rich oceans spread in every direction, their surface giving off gentle steam under a faint, slow-burning red sun. It's always warm enough to feel like summer, but never enough light to justify wearing sunglasses. Days here are really, really long. One full rotation takes almost 25 Earth days, and that's also the planet's year. So yeah, every sunrise, it's basically a national holiday. But the real secret of the planet is below the waves. You get into your small submarine to explore the water. Under the surface, it's breathtaking. Glowing plankton, towering kelp forests, maybe even some alien sea creatures giving you the side eye. When you resurface, clouds move in, heavy and low like a blanket left messy on a bed. Tides here, they're massive. Sunrises are rare events, not just because the days are weeks long, but because your landing zone might be under 20 feet of water by the time it happens. The locals, if there are any, probably have gills and tide charts. Back at base, you collect geothermal energy from vents, trying not to sweat through your suit. When the rain starts, slow, non-stop, like the planet is stuck in an internal shower with no towel in sight. The air smells like salt and metal. You can't remember the last time you saw the actual sun. But the horizon, that soft orange glow, it's actually kind of beautiful. Quiet, heavy, familiar. And then, over the intercom, Heads up, ocean's rising again. Of course it is. Now, you could stay, fight against the rising tides, build more barriers, argue with the planet itself, but honestly, you've had enough water. So you close your eyes, ready for someplace dry. And when you open them, Proxima Centauri B. You step out of the dome and feel it instantly. Not heat, not cold, but radiation. The sun seems personally offended, turning up the heat and firing straight at your DNA like it's trying to win an argument. Welcome to Proxima B, the closest exoplanet to Earth, just 4.24 light years away, orbiting the nearest star to our sun. Seems like a dream find until you meet the star it's stuck with. It's like moving next door to the sun's angry little cousin who has a habit of launching ultraviolet outbursts for, well, no reason. You narrow your eyes behind your visor. The light outside is deep red, you expected sunsets, but instead everything just looks like it's been dunked in cranberry juice and left to dry. You scan the terrain. No trees, no water, just a cracked, worn-down surface that looks like it's been stomped by gravity and roasted by solar storms. Speaking of gravity, it's almost 10% stronger than Earth's. So if you were standing here, you'd feel a little heavier, but nothing too dramatic. More like carrying a small backpack everywhere. Annoying, maybe, but manageable, absolutely. Then you test the air, taking a careful breath and, no surprise, even with your respirator, the air tastes like someone boiled pennies and decided to call it atmosphere. All mineral, no oxygen. So, of course, you're coughing, you adjust your suit, and you keep walking. Proxima Centauri's days last 11 Earth days. On paper, that sounds kind of peaceful, but in reality, it's a week and a half of dodging solar flares. The colonists here, they don't bother going outside unless it's absolutely necessary. Life happens underground, or inside UV-shielded domes where space weather alerts go off more often than morning alarms. And when the flares do hit, the sky goes from velvet red to ultraviolet purple. 
even the dust seems to shimmer, like it knows what's coming. You duck into a crevice, your visor adjusting as you wait for the flare to pass. Eventually, the light fades. You step back out, and in the distance, you catch them. Two bright stars, Alpha Centauri A and B, glowing like twin headlights in the sky. Reminders that, yes, there are still places out there, probably less terrifying ones too. You wonder if anything could survive in this mess. If there are plants here, they're not green. They'd glow, hide underground, or just refuse to exist. If kale could grow on Proxima B, it might be tough enough to stop bullets. Colonists keep to a simple rhythm. Short missions, long naps in radiation shelters, and daily check-ins with the usual, will the atmosphere survive, board. The sky stays red, the wind whispers bad ideas, and everything from plants to people have to be built to endure. But hey, at least it's only 4.24 light years from home. So if anything goes wrong, Earth is just a small 73,000 year walk away. Now, time to close your eyes and roll the planetary dice one more time. At least, that was the plan, until your interstellar travel pass says, weekly limit reached. Apparently, bouncing between planets isn't great for your mitochondria. So, while your cells recover, tell us in the comments, which planet would you want to land on next? Or, which of the planets today would you choose to call your next home? Thank you for exploring with us, and I hope to catch you in the next one.